Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, like was said, I'm going to talk about using corpus linguistics to build gender neutral sentences in basically any language. Uh, I don't know if that bar there will go down, so I'll check the allow button there. Uh, yeah, I hope that disappears over time. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. Yeah, there it goes. Anyway, some of you might be thinking, what is corpus linguistics? Uh, I can assure you, it's got nothing to do with religion. The downside of it is that there's no wine involved, at least not in this presentation. What corpus linguistics is, is essentially the attempt of linguists to say, okay, we've got a bunch of data and going through all of that data is very, very hard. So we'll use computers to do that for us. So the data is our corpus. The problem, however, is that computers aren't very good at reading books, for instance. So if you ask the wrong questions, you have to read the books yourself as well. So the other thing that might be interesting is wait, there, why you should care about forming gender neutral sentences at all. And there's two types of answers to this. There's the obvious ones. Gender equality is really, really important. It helps especially to represent transgender people. The less obvious ones are the questions surrounding gender have become more and more accepted in mainstream culture. Just look at elections, for instance, in the US. Hillary Clinton has been labeled the women's candidate and in Canada, Justin Trudeau made a really strong statement about feminism. The other uh, less obvious answer is that in Sweden, in 2015, laws were actually changed to use a gender neutral pronoun. And that's really, really remarkable because in linguists, or we as linguists say that uh, language change reflect or comes from speech into writing and law texts are really the most traditional forms of writing because they're usually not changed. It takes a lot of time and money and hassle to change them. So the fact that they were changed means that this is really, really important, at least in Sweden. So the way I'm going to structure this presentation is basically giving you two approaches from history with literature examples on how this was attempted to do and a third one based on my own research. The first approach is trying to use he and modifying existing titles of office to construct gender neutral sentences. The problem here, however, is that he is not really gender neutral because it predisposes maleness. And while modifying existing titles of office is a really great idea, if we look at the contemporary American English corpus, we see that chairperson has 700 times less hits than chairman. And the other option of using it is problematic because it's got connotations of inanimateness. The literature example for this approach is <coughs> Ursula Le Guin's Left Hand of Darkness. But it faced the problems, even though it was very popular, that led the author to actually say that her use of he as a gender neutral pronoun was wrong. And she later on revised actually the entire novel to reflect that. So what went actually wrong, specifically because using the modified titles seemed like a great idea. There's no really ready-made explanation for this. We could say that chairperson is too artificial and that's why people don't like using it. The other one is that when you have new words come into the language, there needs to be either a big group or an influential group that uses it so that other people start using it as well. And that uh, apparently isn't happening with chairperson. An example of when that was happening was in the Norman Conquest, the French brought in a bunch of French words like mutton and beef. And because they were the new ruling class, those words really easily filtered into the English language. The second approach is far more radical. It's saying, we need to invent a new pronoun to actually fill this slot, so what they did in Sweden. And in the English language, this actually has some history. So in 1890, in the US, you had hesh and shim. And in 1978, there was a proposal to introduce le, lim, lur, and lurs, respectively. Both of these attempts failed, however. In 2009, however, 
uh, hen in Sweden was introduced into the Swedish National Encyclopedia, though that was also only after failed attempts in 66 and 94. And now when I say attempts, this means these are concerned members of the public doing these attempts and not politicians, just to give some context. The literature example for this is Woman on the Edge of Time. Marge Pierce uses the pronoun per from person to denote people in it, but there was an, essentially a marketing issue with that novel that led it to be very niche. It's not been translated into any other major language apart from English. So why did some attempts fail and others didn't? So linguists call pronouns close class words, so you can't really introduce new words into that word class. And the reason why in Sweden it might have been a success is because Sweden uh, prides itself on being egalitarian. And Sweden has a big population of Finnish people and has always had that more or less. And in Finland you have a neutral pronoun called han, which is very similar in its pronunciation to hen. And the fact that Swedes have always been around this pronoun might have made them more susceptible to accept this new gender neutral pronoun. But because not all languages have these advantages that Sweden have, we need a more general approach that fits everybody, and that's where I come in. So I propose to use existing ambiguities in languages based on corpus linguistic research that I once again did on the left hand of darkness. And it showed when I compared them to English and Spanish, which have gender in different amounts in their grammar, that English in particular used gender neutral names and titles, and Spanish relied on the use of ambiguous dative, so indirect object pronouns le and se. The option not found was they, so in speech in English you could say, have you seen the new intern? No, I haven't seen them. So this is essentially the tool I used, it's Antconc, and I ser here's the search window for the se pronoun. What you can see there is, because in Spanish you can use this as a suffix for commands and gerunds, I need to search not only for the word but every instance of se occurring in every word. And we get a lot of useless data and the uh, tool doesn't distinguish between is this actually ambiguous or is it not. So I needed to figure out a way to make sense of it. So the solution was to make a formula that describes gender neutrality. And what I did there was put a hierarchy up there. So we've got titles that modify proper names, and then we've got ambiguous pronouns which modify imperatives and infinitives in English. So that leads to the example in English that envoy is the cause uh, in the sentence envoy Genli told them to run, and them as well because envoy modifies Genli. In Spanish, we, I had to modify this with the clitic doubling before the names and the pronouns because in dative uh, objects can be modified by this a shuskis in the sentence Ege miembro del gobierno me le introdujo that basically tells you what le is referring to. The actual data then can be seen in these graphs. So because this is a first person narration, we have a lot of I going on as an ambiguous pronoun and because it's sci-fi, proper names that are gender neutral and invented also occur. But because this doesn't really happen in normal language, the titles and professions, the red slice, is actually the interesting bit. And comparing that to Spanish, we can see in Spanish, the titles and professions are only 0.18% compared to the 3.2 in English. In Spanish, actually, verbs that don't have a pronoun are important and these ambiguous pronouns that I talked about before. So we can see here the ambiguous pronoun usage in el, ella, and ellos, ellas is actually bigger than the use of the specific ones combined. So that shows us that that's a strategy. The conclusions are then that instead of trying to force a new pronoun to be uh, accepted or to modify existing titles of office, we can use existing ambiguities in the language like the pronouns or what Le Guin did in English, instead of using king, she used sovereign, which is gender neutral. This has the benefit that the grammar doesn't need to be changed radically, the language doesn't need to be changed radically because it's using things that are already in usage. However, the method is not all exhaustive. In Spanish, you need to get rid of determiners and adjectives, and languages like German are very limited in how they can use this. 
But further areas where the same method could be used is areas surrounding possession and grammar surrounding distinctions between inanimate and animate objects, so animals, for instance. So these are just references. And if anybody has any questions, I'm all up for them. Thanks for listening. Yeah. And the, the introduction of that term in Sweden, that wasn't without controversy. So what do you think about that? I mean, it wasn't just, oh, let's just adapt this. No, no, there was definitely, like any big change, there was some controversy. I do think it's, as a linguist, it's very interesting because previously we said doing something like that is never going to work. And it seems to be working. People use it. I read it in the newspaper all the time. So I'm actually really happy that it worked out. There's obviously different levels of implementation of this, yeah. uh, from you know, preschoolers at a very young age to Gore-Tex, like you referenced. Yeah. Um, what problems do you believe will be encountered, say, at lower levels, lower levels, at younger ages for preschoolers when they try to learn these uh, in, say, English? In English, well, if we, for instance, say that we want to use them a lot, it's actually quite easy. It's just telling them to use them, like we had in Swedish with hen. What it actually, where it all started, was with children's books. They started using it in children's books, and children picked it up and they liked it. So it would be easy in English. In Spanish, it requires that you know how the grammar works a bit better, and there <laughs> is where it might be harder to actually implement because you need a certain amount of knowledge about the language that preschoolers might not yet have. Do you think it will be more difficult to introduce gender neutral pronouns in languages where the whole language is gendered, for example, <coughs> French or German? Or? Well, German especially is like, I tried to have Spanish as an example here because there the grammar revolves around gender as well. But in German, the problem is that it lacks or has so few ambiguities. And that's where we might need to try and take more drastic measures like figuring out, OK, how did Sweden manage to implement this new pronoun? Because that's the easiest way, probably, for those languages to do that. And is there anything we can apply to German, for instance, or French, for that matter? If, are you satisfied with that answer? I'm not sure. Yeah. Why do you think it is important to move towards uh, non-gender sentences? So obviously, for me personally, gender equality is very important. And I've had, for instance, friends who work in customer service situations where they are very uncomfortable, not because they have to serve a transgendered uh, person, but they don't know how to react in these situations. And this obviously also has an effect, for instance, on the person they're serving because they feel like they're not treated the same as everybody else because everybody is a bit jumpy and, uh, well, uncomfortable around them, not because they're homophobic or transphobic, but just because they don't know how to express themselves properly without causing offense. Any chance you could give me an example? Because there's no way to So I had a friend who works at the Glasgow Marrow Clinic, and he had to, uh, one of his customers was a transgender person, and afterwards he was trying to tell me about this uh, incident, and he was, constantly like he no I mean she well you know did this and he was clearly distressed about not being able to express himself and on the flip side one of my other friends is transgender and sometimes she is like she wishes there was an easy way for people to actually address her without going all into the he she because it uh, it's a sort of form of like assuming that you're one thing with when you're actually not, if you know what. Like, uh, if you're, for instance, seeing a transgender person, you refer to them as he, well, while they're actually not he, they're not actually completely male, that inhibits, uh, for instance, their, how, the, how they feel that they're perceived by society, and it might actually have effects on how integrated they feel or how uh, appreciated they are. In uh, terms of like literature, that's often referred to as structural violence. Thank you.